first of all, I want to thank uh, Timmy for helping me put this together and um, John Nymeister and Lake Hurwitz, uh, two of my favorite people. Three, actually. I'll, I'll include Timmy. <laughs> um, I was just thinking about uh, Timmy. Timmy's a non-artist. He's my he's my favorite person as a non-artist. Oh, that's um, nice. Favorite non-artist people. It's a really special place to be. <laughs> it is the uh, non-artist for me. Uh, so um, we're here today. Uh, for, uh, we are sponsored by the Visual Arts Passage. Everything we do comes from the Visual Arts Passage. And so we'll let people know that uh, our enrollment closes on uh, July 12th for next semester. Classes start on the 16th. We have a, uh, a, a focus in character design uh, in our concept program. And we got a very complete illustration program, uh, two different directions. They cross mingle quite a bit. We have a, a, a venue every Wednesday night where they're shared instructors and students from both sides in our study hall where we can students come in and bring work to be critiqued and suggestions and paint overs and uh, just really um, good information from some very good artists to help people with their assignments. So we'll talk more about that later. Um, so first of all, I have, I've always been a um, a stickler about this. If we're going to do a talk, I'm going to show who you're talking to. <laughs> and so uh, John Neimeister is a wonderful artist. Uh, I, I, I don't know what to call him, actually. Uh, he works in the concept art world. He works in the entertainment world. I think he's a great illustrator. Um, yeah, he's a wonderful picture maker. Uh, has a lot of skill and craft to understand how to design and develop characters and backgrounds and environments. But I look at him as a really wonderful picture maker. He does a lot of splash work. Um, and he's a, I don't know what the exact title is, senior, I don't know if it's senior concept artist, senior whatever, senior superstar artist at uh, <laughs> um, High Res Studio in Atlanta. Technically 2D lead, but the titles. Okay not as useful a piece of information as just looking at the work for sure. <laughs> I'm just going to call him a kick-ass artist. How about that? <laughs> so, I'll take it. <laughs> uh, anytime you can be called that, I think it's, it's worth being called that. Um, I always love this. Is it just a, as an illustration, it's just so beautiful. Um, Missy great, Elliott, right? Missy Elliott. It yeah. is. <laughs> some great variation with his picture making. Um, and the reason I go through this is, and, and I want to show this, is this is, this is uh, who delivers our information. It's always been that way with the Illustration Academy, developing uh, education that's designed to help you develop yourself to work in the industry. And I think it's best taught by people that work in the industry. Um, I, I, I know I'll upset people. Uh, I have some of my best friends that teach at art and design schools. Um, some of them are great practitioners also. Um, but if you wanna learn about what's going on in the industry, you better, work, better learn from somebody who's doing it day in and day out, especially in this side of the industry, because it moves quickly and it changes. Um, there's great timeless information you can learn at universities and art schools, um, but connecting to artists that work in the industry is huge. Um, it's huge. Uh, um, I get, you know, I get a kick out of, uh, well, I'm going to our next, uh, Vivian's not here today, but she's one of our instructors. Um, and Vivian uh, is, was with High Res Studio and is now at uh, Blizzard. And she works on the Diablo team. The art director that she works with was one of her instructors when she was in school, was John, John Mueller. And so long-term relationships that you build from the very beginning are very impactful and very important. And that wouldn't have happened if she wasn't learning from somebody that was in the industry. She created that relationship with a really great industry artist who became uh, an employee of Blizzard, an art director there, that um, again, I don't know his exact title, but I look at him as uh, you know, uh, 
kind of a, a, a creative director over the Diablo games. And John uh, had a long-term relationship with Vivian. And it, it, it definitely pushed her career forward. Anyway, Vivian teaches our advanced concept class. John teaches our, our, um, our, inter, our, our fundamentals of character design. And then next on the list is Mr. Lake Hurwitz. And Lake is another kick-ass artist uh, that haven't found many things that Lake can't do or doesn't know about <laughs> um, and um, can certainly point you in many different directions. Uh, my favorite thing, well, a couple of favorite things I remember because Lake and Lake and John both come into study hall frequently and Lake is kind of a fixture there. And some of the things he says to students, my favorite quotes are draw a dumber, which I love that term. Uh, you got to draw a dumber and it's very important. And you got to, you got to develop concept brain. And those two things have made me think about what concept artists do more than anything. Um, you know, the ability to, to, to give up on ideas, the ability to keep looking for a better solution and always imagine that this has, somebody has to build this thing. And uh, Lake's curiosity and his uh, his concept brain I find very fascinating um, so um, some of the beautiful imagery here of lakes another again um, great picture maker um, I'm showing mostly what I you know beautiful pictures that are that are illustrations even especially these these are little paintings I love these things um, it all relates. Um, it's all, you know, it, it all comes down to good composition and, and execution facilitation that you, uh, you garner to develop yourself. Aimed in different places. So these are the, these are the people that are going to be basically filling in what I don't know. Um, I'm going to admittedly tell everybody that I'm an illustrator and a painter. And, um, what I don't know from the concept world, I, I rely on people that know a lot about it. And these are two of the individuals that I rely on the most. And um, I think they're going to, I'm, I'm going to relate things to what I know and ask questions about portfolio as it relates to the concept side. So first of all, Lake and John say hi. You haven't said a word yet. I haven't allowed you to. You're just on such a good roll. Yeah. <laughs> Hello to John and everyone. Lake, hey, everybody. there we go. <laughs> so uh, again, I, I, I'm going to approach this how I would, uh, uh, with what I don't know, but how I think about portfolio on the illustration side. Um, I still think very consistent, uh, the, the, the similarities, are, there's a lot of similarities. First one being, it's what represents you. It's the, th you know, you can't, um, you can't talk your way into something. You can't, relationships are important, but they're only important if you're, if you have the work to support it. And that everything that is, it, that identifies you in the industry is your portfolio. It, it, you know, it, and, and I, and, and from what I've learned recently, it's what lives on art station, right? Um, uh, it's one of the main uh, art station being one of the main venues uh, for people to, to use as a resource to find talent. Um, we on the illustration side, we have like, you know, we have spectrum and I assume some of spectrum is part of the concept world people the fantasy um, resource book that they produce every year. I think part of some concept artist li lives in there. But when you go to ArtStation, I think that, that uh, the people, the buyers use ArtStation like all the resources put together for the illustration world. Um, it, it, everybody kind of lives there and there's a lot of choices. Um, so, I, I, you know, I think, I think you should think of your portfolio really as a job interview. It's how people perceive you. Uh, you should, you need to do your due diligence. You need to do your research on what goes in your portfolio. Uh, if you want to work for Blizzard Games, I 
highly suggest you know everything you can about Blizzard games. Any job interview anybody's ever been on, I hope they research the company before they go on the interview. Um, know how you could be of benefit to that organization. This is big picture stuff. And uh, John and Lake, please interrupt me and tell me what you should really be focusing on. Uh, as an illustrator, um, voice is huge. Personal identity is huge. It may be, may be much less so. On the, you know, there's certain jobs that you get hired in a studio that are production that are that are more about technical facilitation, I assume. Uh, and there's some that are very much about the way you think and the and and your voice. Um, so understanding, you know, where you want to work, what part of the pipeline you want to work in and know about the industry as much as you possibly can. Yeah. Um, I think in, it's still very much a part of concept art, the difference that I see between illustration and concept in terms of like your voice is an illustration that usually includes your art style where they want people to buy their magazine or their book because, oh, this is my favorite cover artist. I love the way he paints. Uh, in entertainment, at least in, in gaming, usually you have to match your style to the product that's already there, unless you're like part of developing the style, but your voice is still important in it's the way that you think. So it's not like the way that your pictures look on the page, but when handed a text brief, the way that you process it and come up with a solution is unique to you. And so if that part of your voice fits the, the aesthetic that they're going for with their product, then your voice matters just as much because you solved the problem in a way that someone else wouldn't have. And that's what they're looking for. When I'm looking to hire somebody or um, when I'm shopping around my work, the things that I always think about are um, that technical facilitation that you were talking about, John. Um, that is the equivalent of your college degree. It's like, you have to have that before you can do anything else. And then everything past that, you can show off whatever voice you want, as long as you are also demonstrating that core competency of high degree of technical facilitation. And even better, if you show that you can imitate other styles or uh, flow your work into other artwork styles. So there is definitely room for voice but sort of as the icing on top rather than an essential part. Like, I'm first going to apologize to you because I, I kind of shorted you on the intro. I forgot to tell everybody where you worked. What, can you please tell people what you sure. did? So uh, I am the principal visual development artist for Wizards of the Coast franchise. Um, what that means is our team takes things like Dungeons and Dragons and Magic the Gathering and prepares them and adapts them for other media. So we don't work on the games, we work on things like the upcoming D&D movie and the upcoming Magic the Gathering Netflix series um, and a bunch of stuff that's in the works that I can't talk about. And then uh, I will do a great deal of that work myself. Um, and then to kind of fill out all of our additional needs, I will hire additional freelance artists either on short contract basis or on a piece by piece basis to, um, to work with us to kind of do that adaptation work. Um, there's a lot of cross communication. And I, I'd say probably my job is at the moment about 60, 40 art direction to art making. Um, I prefer it at 50, 50. And so I'm leaning, uh, leaning it back in that direction a little bit. Um, as I mentioned, our study halls uh, where concept and illustration program kind of come together. And a lot of our illustrations, there's a, there's a lot of gray area when, um, like, like in the RPG games, the, the, the card art, some of the, a lot of the fantasy stuff where there's crossover, where concept artists do illustration, illustration, uh, illustrators do picture making for, and that's why I, you know, both, both of you have great picture making skills um, also. And, um, and so there's quite a bit of crossover and I love the, the day, it happens every semester and for the last four or five semesters, um, or more longer than that, is that we get quite a few students that want to do magic cards. And, and they come into study hall, and I keep saying to them, you really need to go show this to Lake and get his opinion about it. And they're like, okay, but why? 
<laughs> I'm like, well, think about it. He's an art director at the at the franchise that you want to work for. Um, he knows exactly what you're trying to do and what the outcome should be. And so it's a um, it's a, it's always a fun a fun thing for me. I always have in our portfolio class two or three people that always list like top top uh, venue uh, Magic the Gathering, um, and and I I really laugh about it and just say, <laughs> hey, Lake's your man. And um, so um, I I I say this to illustration students all the time, and and I know by listening to the two of you quite a bit that approaching the concept world. I and again, tell me, tell me to shut up and when I'm wrong and right. Um, the I look at it as okay. You can develop yourself as a generalist, where you know you have the ability to to do lots of different things and have value to a studio for being able to do all these things. Or you can also develop yourself directionally, like really get in focused on one skill set at a very high level. Um, we we have had this discussion a lot about our program. It's like, you know, our program is not, you know, it's four classes, but they can be repeated, um, the, especially the last two classes people take multiple times because they haven't completely finished developing them, themselves. But we focus, we've decided that the best way to focus is on, on character to start with. And we use that as the skill set with the most focus. So tell me, is it common or should somebody get focused or should they be, what is that like an individual choice? What, what is the, your opinion about that? I think it's definitely a complicated thing and it's up to the individual artists to decide how thin they wanna spread themselves. Um, there's definitely a market for artists who can do lots of different things. Obviously, the more roles you can fill, the more valuable you are to a company, um, but it takes time to develop every skill. So if you try to learn them all at once, right at the beginning, you're gonna get like 40% of the way to hireable while your peers who focus get 100% of the way. So in my personal opinion, I think it's better to try to choose one thing that you're most excited about and let that be your gateway into the industry. And then once you kind of have that down pat, you can start branching out into other areas. Because um, especially as you start getting into bigger companies that hire more people, if they can hire, you know, 60 artists, they're going to want each one to specialize and be the best that they can be in that particular arena. Um, if you can do more than one thing, that's great. But if it's a choice between you who does two things pretty well and another person who does one thing extremely well, they're probably going to go with the specialist more than the generalist, uh, which is less true in indie games who hire fewer people and want more generalists. But uh, I think it's an option. You just have to be very thoughtful with how you're spending your time. Yeah, I would fully agree with that. Um, and the interesting thing about being focused is that which focus gets you most hired has changed over time. Um, as the industry shifts, as technology shifts, as the, the way that games and films and other entertainment media are created changes as new innovations are, are put forward in those spaces. Um, so do the needs that those companies and studios have. So for instance, um, 10 years ago, environment art was everybody's biggest need. Um, they needed it uh, more than anything else because every game, every film had to make these worlds to populate. But with the advent of things like Unreal um, and the way that you know the Mandalorian is putting together their sets uh, and the, the uh, sort of meshing of digital and uh, practical creation for film, um, and the advancements in just raw computing power that allows games to kind of handle these photo scanned assets and stuff like that. It means that now all of a sudden the thing that's most valuable to companies is characters, um, different customizable avatars, that sort of thing. Um, I think big, one of the biggest money makers in games right now is just League of Legends skins and, and, uh, Counter-Strike weapon skins. It's basically just that. So, um, but we don't know what the next shift is going to be. There's always going to be another shift in the industry coming up. So it, 
I think it's wise to focus on something that you feel you can do a lot of um, and less what kind of work you're making and more what kind of processes you can do over and over and over again without getting burnt out on. Um, so it's not about, do I make a highly painted, highly rendered, technically beautiful character concept? It's, do I have the patience and the curiosity to pursue all of the different avenues that get me to the most interesting character design for the pipeline that I'm participating in? Wow. Yeah, I fully agree. Um, and I especially love that one note you made to focus on the process, because that was a big revelation for me a few years into being a professional was like, I was lucky enough that I happened to fall into a job where I got to do the kind of work that I enjoy the most. And when I say the kind of work, I'm not talking about subject matter. I'm talking about what I spend my eight hours a day, five days a week doing. Um, as I was in school and learning how to make art, I just loved painting and like really massaging the fine details of lighting and materials, which lends itself really well to making splash art where you have to spend upwards of two or three weeks just painting the thing. So uh, if I didn't enjoy painting, that would be a really bad job for me, even if I really liked the subject matter of the things I was painting. So uh, when we say to like target your portfolio and target the kinds of jobs you're trying to hit, try to focus more on like, what would I actually be doing for eight hours a day in this job? And am I actually going to enjoy that thing? Yeah, I, I, I say this to my students a lot. Um, don't focus on the best case scenario of what your day to day is going to be like. Think instead, like, what's the painful part of work that you can find joy in and something boring that something that would be boring to other people that you find interesting, that kind of stuff. Like, do you enjoy spending three to four hours a day on just searching the internet for images of tanks? Because <laughs> if you like that, then that's a huge part of making realistic tank concepts. Um, and that's, that's one of those kind of unsexy parts of the job. But for some people, it just gives them the opportunity to chase their own curiosity down. All right. I think that's what you mean when you talk about concept art brain too, is just this yeah, that's part endl of it. endless hunger for information. So yeah. if there's just things in the world that you're really curious about and you just love going down Wikipedia rabbit holes and learning all about this obscure, you know, uh, medieval siege engine and like how it works and how they built it. Like, yeah, just to a, speak to being focused more. It's like, I think every, every like, mid to top tier concept artist I've ever met has one or two things that they know just like a ton about, like way mm -hmm. more than you would ever suspect. Yeah. Um, the previous line above the getting focus and commit to a direction was identify your audience. And I think that is understanding the industry as best as you possibly can. And mm -hmm. who makes the work that you're interested in making um, what venues, companies, studios um, uh, produce what you want to produce or the, in the genre that you want to work? And uh, who, are the, who are the leads there? Who are the people there that you're making your portfolio for? Ultimately, it's real simple on the illustration side. It's, um, it's art directors. And, mm -hmm. on, on, you know, and you get into children's books, it's maybe art directors and editors. Um, but most of the traditional illustration world, you're just focused on the art directors because they make all the decisions on hire and aligning assignments with with artists. Um, how does that work in the in the studio world? Is that every is everything different? Is everything um... there are some similarities? So um, the the adjustment that I like to make is uh, there's two things that change the game when you're trying to build a portfolio for concept and and do your research. The first is that um, art director information isn't publicly available. Most studios don't actually have full lists of their staff um, and probably don't have that contact info uh, ready. So word of mouth becomes a lot more important. Um, and I find that the best, the best place to start in my mind, and uh, John, I would love to hear your thoughts on this, uh, is instead of looking for who are the art directors and studio heads, because their information might be outdated online, you don't know. 
Instead, do your research of um, identify artists, not whose work you want to do, but whose life you want to have. Like what about their life is attractive to you? Like, do they have a good work-life balance? Are they constantly moving around between projects or are they committed to a studio? Um, how long do they tend to stay in any particular place and how well are they networked? How public facing are they? And then based on that information, you can identify where are they currently active um, and who are they currently working with? And then uh, networking in those same spaces will lead you toward that, that same space. And then uh, the other side of it is be, be active on ArtStation and uh, be available to people. Yeah. John, I'd, I'd be very curious what you think. No, I totally agree. Um, it's definitely important to be proactive about like sort of tracking down and trying to identify like who you want to work for, where you want to work, what kind of job and career you want to have. Like Lake said, sometimes that information is a little opaque online and you might not be able to get everything you need just from looking at a company's website or trying to look up, you know, staffing information on LinkedIn. Um, sometimes that works out and you can shoot a message to the right person and uh, maybe that'll lead to a good connection, but um, not always because especially in games, uh, art directors are not only like looking, like having to review and potentially like call in talent to be hired, but they're also art directing all day long and they're working with in-house artists and they're working with outsource artists. So uh, most art directors I know aren't spending a lot of time like checking their LinkedIn to see if artists want to get in touch with them. Um, it's more about like word of mouth and like if yeah. someone they know says like, oh my gosh, look at this cool painting and the art director goes, wow, that's really beautiful. That could actually work for what we're making. I wonder if I can contact them. Um, that's much more valuable than just sort of a cold call out of the blue. Uh, and if you can't make that, uh, obviously that's a bit up to chance, so you can't force that to happen, but um, you can also just try to focus on networking organically, not like trying to message people to receive a job in return, but just trying to meet people of all skill levels and all positions, you know, go to industry conventions, um, go to GDC. Uh, if you can't do it, there's lots of lightbox. cool, like, yeah, lightbox. Lightbox. Sure, the big one now. Yeah. yeah. Um, I that's why I was saying like what you just said about word of mouth. It's like um, your audience to kind of speak directly to what John has up on the screen. Your audience is the other artists, you know, and kind of depends on what stage you're in. If you're a junior artist, the best recommendation you can possibly get for a job is going to be a senior artist telling their producer or their art director, we should hire this person. So that um, requires you though, like to know who that senior artist is. That's, yes. that's yes. your responsibility. I mean, yes, that, yes. that's how I look at it. Um, and you find I, I, out who those people are by participating in those spaces. I, I, you know, as artists, and again, you're an artist first. I don't care what, what direction you go. You have to think of yourself as an artist first. And I remember um, telling, uh, it wasn't me, it was another one of our instructors telling a student their work looked closely like somebody else's. And I know that the student manufactured this they said well i never i don't even know who that artist is they don't look at that artist and the person they were arguing with looked at him and said that makes you just as wrong you should know who that person is because <laughs> you're a well-known artist in the industry and that's your responsibility as an artist uh those are the type of things responsibilities you have to take as an industry artist you have to think that way um yeah. you got to know how this whole thing works illustration side you know all those resource books that are produced and the shows they have every year it pretty much outlines everything it tells you what artists work for what art directors for what companies if you pay attention to those it's very simple there's a little bit more of a, um, a, a cloak and dagger type thing going on in the concept world and so it's like um, how does how does I don't see the direct line. I think what you're saying is very important, but I still think at bottom line, it comes down to understanding the industry as best as you can. And then think about some of the soft skills, the non-art skills that are gonna benefit you. 
um, which we can talk more about later. I'm going to jump to another slide here. And I'm going to I'm going to start this slide by I see this every day in portfolio reviews, talking to students, talking to emerging artists. Everybody has their own needs. It could be physical, it could be location, it could be limitations on finance, it could be family relationships, whatever it is, we all are individuals. And you have to think about what works for you. And look at the industry and saying, oh, I could do this, I could never do that. Because, you know, you know, I have students students that are like, I gotta get a visa. I got to get, I, I got to be able to stay in the country. I got to figure this out really quickly. Um, or I live in a country that there's, uh, um, there's no work here. I'm going to have to go to another location or I'm going to have to figure out how to work as a distance as a freelance artist. And so you really need to take a deep dive into yourself first and figure out, Lake said something really earlier uh, earlier that I really responded to because I think about that as a painter. It's like, what subject matter even? What can I do for a long period of time that I'm gonna enjoy and that I'm gonna uh, 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 thrive at um, for myself? You know, you gotta think about those things. But this, you know, the basic, almost common sense approach of how, how, you know, I, you know, if you can't, if you can't move location or it, it, you have restrictions and things that are unique to yourself, that better be, you better be relating those problems to how the industry works. So maybe you two can talk about that a little bit. And hey. Hey, John, I was also, well, we have a few questions uh, stacking up. I know we might save a few uh, for the end like we did uh, yesterday. Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, that, a few hundred? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we have uh, no, we're not that, we're not that bad yet. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, do, do you, John Lake, do you have any of these that you want to tackle now or? Do you want to do save a Q&A for later? There, there's just one that kind of came up that I wanted to answer here. Awesome. Um, the, you know, it was related to the question about the overlap between the illustration and concept art industries, specifically in the magic space. Um, and somebody was asking, like, would it be better to study one illustration or two concept art if they wanted to go into that? And the honest answer is it, it actually doesn't really matter. Um, the thing that magic needs are compositional skills, uh, a healthy knowledge of process, and a good degree of imaginative realism uh, skills. So you, ha you have probably a lot of the same technical abilities that go into painted concept art um, that go into imaginative realism illustration. Um, so most illustration programs are a little broader than imaginative realism. And most concept art programs, including ours, focus more on creating assets for entertainment art than we do on illustration. But either kind of program can provide those skills. It just comes down to the individual artist to determine whether the programs they're participating in actually do. Yeah, and I think it's important to note that a lot of work <laughs> in the entertainment industry kind of requires both. Um, mm -hmm. Like if, if you wanna work you know, on, D, D or Pathfinder books and do those interior illustrations. That's illustration work, but you're going to be handed a text brief that you're going to have to be able to convert into a character design. So you have to concept it and then you have to illustrate it. Um, and that's not like you have to learn two entirely different sets of career skills. There's a lot of overlap between illustration and concept art. Um, but if you are looking at working in the entertainment industry specifically, video games, films, tabletop RPGs, um, anything in that sphere, you kind of need a little bit of both illustration or concept art skills. Um, you can definitely weight yourself more towards the side that you're interested in, but uh, both of them are important for nearly every job you'll come across. Yeah. Well, again, um brag about the program a little bit. I love when those two come together in study hall. 
and you have access. Um, this uh, part of what we do too is introduce artists to them. You know, learning about the industry, learning the path of others, I think is very, very important. How did, you know, we this last semester in a three week span, we had Carlo Ortiz, Chris Ron, and Thomas Blackshear. And I mean, what, you know, it's like murderer's row. And um, one, Thomas was from the illustration side, Carla and Chris were on the entertainment side. And, <clears throat> and they both did, Tom did some entertainment work along through his career. And, and both Chris and, and uh, Carla, you know, kind of go both directions. Um, bringing artists, introducing artists and what they, and how they how they developed and what they do in the industry is really learning about the industry. It's the best way I know to learn a lot about the industry of, um, from from an artist's perspective, is hearing it, what actually happens in their career in their life. Um, and I can't tell it, 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 Timmy and I would not do it. I mean, it would be so much easier just to remove those things. Uh, because we're constantly chasing talent. You're constantly booking. You're, you, you know, we got to pay for it. We got to take the energy to do it. And, but the value is so high. Um, we, it's, it's irreplaceable in my mind uh, about learning art. And it's like, you got to know the industry. You got to know how people function in the industry. Um, so, um, pay close attention, learn as much. Again, it's like any opportunity you have to be around artists that are doing what you want to do, sidle, uh, get as close to them as you possibly can. Um, the artist's social life is so important. Like you, you mentioned here, consider your options and you, you need to identify what your needs are. Um, it, there are, I guarantee every student there are things, there are ways you could be living an artist's life that you've never even dreamed about that somebody within your social circles knows about. So talk to everybody about the different kinds of life that they've heard about living or ever thought to desire because chances are there's something out there that you didn't even know existed. Like I think in my first studio job, this is, I did freelance for a while, but um, in my first full-time studio job, I met some guys that came into concept art for mobile games from doing casino murals in Vegas. They All they did all day was do these gigantic wall scale paintings of like highly realistic art. And they flowed freely from that into making games for iPads. Hmm. Interesting. Um, um, yeah. And that's yeah. why networking is so important too. Uh, Cause especially within the the entertainment industry um, on the illustration side, most people tend to be independent contractors that just sell their services to various clients in the gaming industry. There's so much more sustained work. There is still a lot of independent contracting, but a lot of people get hired in house to just work a full-time job. And a lot of those artists working in house, like they've made it and they have their connections. So they have no need to promote themselves online. So you would almost never even know that they existed and like how they live their life and do their work, but they're working artists, working jobs they enjoy uh, on projects they're excited about. And if you don't, you know, make that push to go out and meet people and learn about their different experiences, then you won't know the full breadth of options that are available to you career-wise. That's basically me. I have almost no online presence. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you both have art station. Now, like you need to you need to add more work to your art station. Picture. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this, that's the other part of it is like <laughs> one of the reasons things are so inaccessible when you're looking for who's who's leading a life that's interesting is because in entertainment art, um, the projects have a longer lead time. In the illustration world, I think the most I ever see between um, commissioning and delivery of the product to consumers is like maybe a year and a half at most. And a lot of the time it's actually much, much, much faster than that. Like uh, there are places that need art that's gonna go to the printers within three to five months. Um, but in entertainment art, everything is NDA until the thing is released. And a lot of it stays NDA after the thing is released because you don't know what's gonna be in the tank for use later. Um, so 
all of the work that I could post that is finished work that I have done over the course of my career is three to five years old and no longer represents the stuff that I'm doing now. Um, it, it makes it really important for working artists, uh, and this is something that I am working on getting better at, to produce personal work, to show people the directions that you're heading in. Um, it's one of the things that I'm uh, very glad to be participating in with the classes is to be able to do demos uh, of different kinds of projects and different ways of approaching character design in the way that I have learned to do it over more than 10 years in the industry and the way that I'm going to do it going forward. And um, I'll probably finish out some of those and put them in my portfolio sooner or later. In contrast, I I just one. in contrast to all of that, I want you to think about uh, one of, on the illustration side, uh, Catherine Lamb, who's just a phenomenal illustrator. Um, a lot of Catherine's work are like op-ed pages for the New York Times. That's a call she gets that Catherine will get at eight to nine o'clock in the morning. And Catherine has to produce a finish before the end of the day. Yeah. Printed in the New York Times uh, or in online. Um, you know, the funny thing is like the concept work speed is comparable to that. I had a, a thing right. come up earlier this year related to the D&D the &D film um, that a thing was going to go out and it, I didn't think it was going to necessarily look that good. And so I, because I have, um, you know, an amount of influence, I said, you know what, I'm just going to do a better one, but I have two hours to do it. So <laughs> it was get it out the door, but now nobody's going to see that piece for, I don't know how long. That's interesting. Um, okay. So I think this is, I, I think that what, what we're getting to is understand the industry really well. Mm -hmm. Think about what your needs are. What, what do you want from this? It's very, very important to think this way. Don't try to develop for something that you're not capable of doing or that you don't want to do. Um, I always tell artists that first thing that they should do, painters or illustrators, is look at the artwork that you love. Look at the artists that influence you. Use them like muses. And if that's going to be your direction, pick Pick a direction that is the thing you want to do the most. Um, you're going to have to compete at the highest level. You better be doing something you love <laughs> because I really, this is one of my, I say it too often maybe, but um, uh, want outruns talent in this industry. Uh, people that want to do something will figure out how to do it. And, and it, it's the interest uh, because they love doing it. It's hard to compete with somebody that's really passionate. Um, so pick what you're passionate about and you, you will compete at a higher level. You'll put more into it. Okay, we'll go to another slide here. Um, okay, so th these are things that I pulled from the illustration, thinking about the illustration side. Maybe you can manipulate these a little bit that's more directed. I do like what you were saying. I think one of the first things that you have to, decisions you have to make, what is the function I'm gonna show? What is, what's the direction I'm gonna take? Am I gonna be a generalist? Am I gonna be a specialist? Make those decisions. Who's making the work that you wanna work that you want to produce for identify what your dream clients your dream clients are as an illustrator <laughs> um you don't show an art director something that they're not going to be interested in it's like a waste of time if you're if if you want to do celebrity portrait and they do you know romance novels um they have no interest in that even if it's beautifully done and then there's two things you have to think about is, is, is it right for them? And is the function right? Um, there's so much different, you know, most obvious thing to think about when you're looking at, you see a beautiful illustration and in study hall, Lake is always asking or John or myself is like, what's this for? What's the, what's the outcome of this? It has a function. It has a purpose. Everything does in the industry. It's, it, it's made for, it, it, it's, it, it has a job to do. And so if you're showing an art director things that they either that don't have a purpose or they can't figure out what the purpose is, again, you're wasting your time. 
Um, most art directors on the illustration side want to see things that they do. So if they do if they do fantasy cover art, they want to see fantasy cover art. It could be, and again, just function alone, it could be the most beautiful painting and image that you've ever seen and can make the worst illustration ever because it doesn't convey what the job actually is or what the solution is. And, you know, it's either narrative or conceptual. And um, if, if it's not conveying the concept or telling the story well, it's a not, it does not function. Doesn't matter how beautifully drawn and painted it is. So maybe you could bring some specifics to some of these things that I'm talking about. Yeah, I think that's a really important thing to note. Um, and especially in the entertainment world, it really is all about the function. Um, as the industry has gotten bigger and education has gotten more affordable, there is more time invested into making concept art like really pretty. Um, but once it's functional, it's basically done. Like if you look at a lot of Ralph McQuarrie's Star Wars concept art, he did a lot of beautiful illustrations for that that obviously helped push like the tone of the film. But a lot of his like designs for really important characters like Darth Vader, it looks like he scribbled them on a napkin in ballpoint pen and it's like barely legible, but the design is there and it looks and it feels cool. And that's really like what matters in concept art. Um, and I think this ties into the question Ethan's been asking of uh, looking at finalized character sheets and seeing like turnarounds and uh, call outs and just like a well-arranged final concept sheet and like how important that is to your portfolio. Um, I would say it's, it's pretty important, but again, it depends on the function. If you want to work in video games or film, um, you're probably going to have to be able to do those turnarounds because they're going to have to send it to a 3D modeler. That modeler might be an outsourcing person and you're not going to be able to talk to them to explain things. So if the turnaround isn't correct, that's going to cause problems in the pipeline and that's wasted time and money. Uh, if you want to work in tabletop where, you know, you're just designing characters for other illustrators to illustrate, uh, you know, like Wayne Reynolds did a lot of stuff for Pathfinder. He doesn't have to do turnarounds for those characters. He just makes them look cool. And then other illustrators can interpret them in their various versions. So uh, anytime you're considering what do I put in my portfolio, you have to do what John's been saying and like dig into the company and be like, what are these concept artists doing? Is this going to 3D modelers? Is this going to costume designers? Is this going to be a claymation that has to be bendable and flexible in the real world? Um, there's no way to answer the question of what you should have in your portfolio and what's functional unless you know what the product is and how it's going to be produced. I can help with that a little bit because even with things like Wayne's concepts for tabletop, that, that design philosophy of do one character and then kind of extrapolate has fallen by the wayside a little bit um, as people realize that there's value in exploring full cultures, call outs, motifs and, and uh, patterns, that kind of stuff. So what that sort of schematic sheet does, especially when coupled to um, a more illustrative piece of concept art is it proves that you can do all of those things. And um, that's not the only way to prove it. The recommendation that I actually give people is think less in terms of pieces and more in terms of projects because the actual valuable skill is getting a project done. And that project can have a whole bunch of different assets or different needs that need to go into it. Um, and every project might be different. So one project's final output might be a 3D model. Another project's final output might be a bunch of storyboards. Um, a, another good example of really scribbly concept art that looks really good is like George Miller's storyboards for uh, Freary Road or Bong Joon Ho's storyboards for Parasite, they're all very, very, you know, simplified, pared down uh, things. And I, I find myself a lot at work doing my concept art basically with stick figures because it's just faster and it communicates what I need to communicate. And then eventually, sometimes we actually have to get something out the door that's a little bit more polished because the purpose of a more polished piece is to move money around. It's to provide points of reference for directors to use to, to kind of show other people what they want. Um, so, you know, those 
schematic sheets are the easiest way to prove that you can do all of the other things. That's interesting. Um, as an illustrator, again, um, the last in big ball type there is be memorable. And mm -hmm. voice is really important um, as a as an illustrator. It's like, um, you know, what separates you from somebody else? What uh, is identifiable as you? You know, the, the number of artists, you know, even the, the uh, not even, but especially our instructors, you know, Sterling Hundley, I don't need to see a, 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 a credit on any of Sterling's work. I know it when I see it. He, it, 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 the, the work embodies him, the way he thinks, the, the way he designs, the problem solving. I know it's his work. Um, that has huge power as, as, in, our, in my, my side of the industry because it's memorable to the art director and they know what they're going to get. The reason I bring that up where, it might, where, where there might be a little bit of a conflict to it and um, showing an art director uh, that you can do something in a unique way. Um, again, there's different parts of your industry that they're maybe not looking for uniqueness. Um, and then the memorable part, um, there's a difference because you were saying how art how art directors pursue talent and how they look at the talent how il, how art directors pursue talent in the um, illustration side it's the illustrators pursuing the art director like constantly you know sending direct mail sending newsletters sending um, trying trying to to point them to awards that they've won just constantly updating them and and creating a visual um, uh, recognition. So an art director, most of the time, hires an illustrator. Like they start reading a brief, they're reading a story, and they think, "Oh, I use people that I that I remember." And that the and so really the the goal of the emerging artist is to become memorable. You've you've done it. You've made your contact. You've done your research, and you've you keep chasing this art. They they expect to be chased. Um, it's a little, it sounds like it's a little bit different on the concept side. Um, Not absurdly different. And uh, I, I do want to say one more thing about those schematic things, um, because it'll flow directly into the thing you're talking about now, John. Um, one of the things we've been discovering, uh, and I, I think it's something that we kind of knew instinctively, but have a language for now, uh, through conversations with other concept artists from other companies, um, there's a question in the, uh, in the, list that's what kind of um, what kind of components or skills are underrepresented in portfolios but have a need in the industry and that has a bunch of different answers but in this context uh, we've learned that once you once you have 10 years under your belt and everything is word of mouth and everybody already knows who you are you can get away with having a portfolio that just has beautiful work in it because people kind of game recognize game people know that somebody who can do that can do the rest for younger artists, for emerging artists who are just entering the industry, demonstrating those technical proficiencies is a way around trying to make that highly polished uh, final work that looks like it could jump right out of an art book. Um, so it's more important to do those schematics at the beginning. And mm -hmm. as you get more and more established, you learn to show those things and how to trust a 3D team to interpret your stuff later. Um, and so in relation to what you're saying now, John, portfolios needing to be memorable, um, it depends on what stage of the industry you're in. If you are there to do asset development, which is to take ideas and make visuals out of them to hand off to modelers, and basically you're part of just part of the pipeline, yeah, maybe that's a little less important because the thing that they need first is proficiency. But then later on in your career, memorability is actually the only way to get to the top levels of concept art, because you are the person who is inventing the thing that millions of people will fall in love with. So, so that's why when when Andy Parks was, you know, yeah. came and spoke with us, he said, hey, I don't even want to see the schematics. Knock me down with a great design, because yep. that's what I want to see. And then I know, and again, it makes so much sense of what you're saying, because most of the people he's looking at He's already aware of it. So it's people that have been around the industry for a while. They can do orthos. He knows that. He goes, I know that they can do the orthos. He goes, but right. he goes, crush me with something. He goes, that's what makes you hireable to me. 
So I, I thought that was interesting. Memorable yeah. means something different in concept art too. Right. Um, like having that memorable art style, like John Neumeister was saying a, a, a bit ago, is less important than having sort of memorable icons in your head. It's like, oh man, Ramona Flowers wears the shoelace of her dead brother around her neck. That's so cool. It kind of doesn't matter what she looks like as long as you can understand that thing about her. Just to put that in ref reference to what I was saying, Andy Parks was a head of, was, I think his title is head of visual development for Marvel Studios um, or a portion of it. And so he's the one hiring and chasing all these wildly talented artists that work for Marvel. Um, and he's one of those himself. He's a really good artist. Um, okay, let's go on. So real quick before we do, uh, oh. I think I think one one last thought on just this idea of memorability um, and what about what Lake was saying about how it's important to show those technical skills and like the turnarounds and schematics when you're newer to the industry is it's important to remember that a lot of art directors are or were artists themselves. Mm -hmm. So they've gone through the ropes and they know what's fun and what's a pain in the butt. And most artists don't really like doing orthos and turnarounds. So they kind of just gloss over it a little bit and maybe they do like a rough one, but don't really refine it and make it correct. So if you're submitting your work to an art director and they see like, oh, they really didn't like invest any time or effort into this turnaround. They just saw that concept artists seem to do that. And so they kind of half-assed it on this image. An art director is going to see the things you skipped because they're difficult to do. And that doesn't leave a great impression because a lot of things in concept art are really difficult to do. And not all, far, uh, not all parts of the process are the fun, creative brainstorming. Sometimes it gets down to just like, you got to do the the grunt work and turn out the ortho and measure all the perspective and it all has to be correct. So if you prove to an art director with your portfolio, hey, I'm willing to do the stuff that's not fun in the interest of making a better, more useful piece of concept art, that's really memorable almost as much as like a good design is, in my opinion. No, oh, well said. Yeah. Really right. well said. Yeah. That, that so, is memorable. So. That, that's very good. So uh, let's get a little bit more focused on our talk here. Uh, Lake, this is you. You can explain this. Well, both of you can explain this. Um, I, was, uh, I was asking Lake and John before the talk, uh, comparing what we do, our chase as uh, our portfolio development, how we identify the audience, all the, how we do all of that, and the process we, we use in our school what's comparable on the concept side. So this is how Lake uh, answered that question. So I'll let you lead here, Lake. Yeah, and I'm curious about uh, John's thoughts on this specifically because I don't think I've showed this to you yet <laughs> and I would love to know what you're thinking here. Um, the, I, and I actually took the end point and worked backwards because one of the things that's really important in concept art is um, you're actually focused on strategy and goals way more than any individual execution of, of something. So to start with the goal, the goal is you wanna get hired and to get yourself hired, you need to show people that you can fulfill their needs and to show them that you need to fulfill their, that you can fulfill their needs. That's where we go back to the beginning and say, ah, you have to identify what those needs are and who is looking to have their needs fulfilled. So that's where it starts with researching and identifying some specific spaces that you're going to try to enter the industry from. Um, and I've, I've given a few different ways to start approaching that here. Um, Art station jobs is probably the biggest at this point um, and most ubiquitous place that people find work. The second, uh, most important is going to be word of mouth. Uh, it's those social events and the, that networking. Um, it, it really does take time to show people that you can think critically, to show people that you're curious and to interact with them in a way that th they can work with you because concept art is such a team effort. Um, and then this is also, you'll see, I, I included that little note about identifying the artists whose life you want and then who do they work with and what spaces are they in? John, any thoughts on, on that stuff so far? No, that all, that all tracks cool. with me, yeah. 
Yeah, and then uh, the second stage there, right in the middle, um, the important thing to do when you're looking for inspiration of how to build your portfolio is to look for functional concept art. Because there's a lot of concept art that, that works as like mood pieces or splash or something like that. And like, while it might technically be part of a concept art pipeline, it doesn't necessarily prove that you can fill somebody's needs. Um, because, you know, to, it's about getting that project out the door. Um, I look at this like that that's, uh, box really is about comparing yourself to what is being made in the industry and saying, how do I get to that level or better at those kinds of projects? And how do I demonstrate those things? Um, and then from that, you can actually write out a plan of what kind of work are you going to make and how are you going to get in touch with the people that need to see it? Yeah, I That's think- That's essentially <laughs> everything in, in a nutshell there. Yeah, and I think the functional concept art is really important too. Mm -hmm. Not that like you can't get hired to do cool mood paintings, but uh, when you think about the scope of an entire project, a game's getting developed, they're gonna put $30 million into this they don't need a lot of mood paintings. So they're for this like small selection of work that's going to set the tone for the whole project. They're going to hire the most well-known, like absolute best at doing these kind of mood paintings to develop the tone for this project. That's not really an entry level job because it holds so much weight in the rest of the pipeline. So it's much more useful to look at functional concept art from the production side of the process rather than the pre-production side of the process, because that's going to be five, 10, 15 years of work that they need to get done. So there's just a lot more of those kinds of jobs available to you, and it's a better place to start and build your name. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, this will kind of additionally answer a few of the questions that we have from Yuki and Ethan there. Um, you know, that means that you uh, that's where the, that bullet there comes from. When you're considering work that goes in your portfolio, you really wanna aim to have very clear work um, to demonstrate that you can explain the things that need to be explained. Um, in illustration, it, when I'm doing card art or you know, when I was, was doing um, other kinds of illustration work, there's often a, a, a viewpoint of, if this part's not working, it can be removed or obscured or blurred out or blacked out um, because it's not important to the image. Well, in concept art, because that thing's got to move and it's got to be built and everybody's going to see it, we need to know what that, that looks like. You can't hide from the places that you don't want to be a part of uh, the beautiful piece that you're making. So making something very clear is kind of the way into that. And then displaying it professionally um, shows your potential employers that they will be able to understand your work. And when you're no longer in the room and your work's being shown to other teams, they'll be able to explain it in your stead too. They don't have to like guess at what you were thinking the whole way because you've shown, shown it so clearly on the sheet. That's really important on the illustration side too, is don't show, it's what I was saying, don't show um, an art director something that they can't understand. Um, it's kind of pointless. Um, um, you have to really consider, you know, maybe pick assignments they've worked on before, uh, stories that they already know. Um, the, the most obvious thing, like celebrity portrait, do portraits of famous people. One of the worst things you can do is do a portrait of somebody who kind of looks like somebody famous. <laughs> um, I, so we ran into that study hall the other night. Um, it, it presented a portrait and I thought it was somebody else. And they go, oh, it's just a friend. And it's like, well, that's the worst thing you could show an art director. <laughs> it looks like a, a badly rendered uh, image of somebody famous. Um, so it's, it's, making, it's making them think of something else. Um, there, there are a number of, and you might explain this a little bit, further there are a number of soft skills that go that align with these mm -hmm. things the value of having great soft skills i vivian i kind of the master of that <laughs> i think she's that she's very very good with her soft skills um and it'd be it, um so maybe maybe you can add a little bit to that of how important those soft skills are or even what they are um 
Yeah, uh, it's definitely important, not only for getting hired, but just having a long and successful career. Because again, on the illustration side, usually you're an independent contractor. So you have to be personable and reliable and not send like aggressive, obnoxious emails to your art directors. Otherwise they won't want to work with you again. But there is always that separation of like, you get to be alone in your studio making art, you send it off and then they can get back to you. Whereas if you're in a studio working on a game or a film, you're collaborating with 10 other concept artists and those 10 other concept artists are collaborating with 30 3D modelers and those modelers are collaborating with the riggers and the animators and everyone else, you know, the producers and the art directors and executives, and you're all working on the same project at the same time. So if you're not easy to work with and you ruffle people's feathers just in the way that you talk or the things that you say, that's not going to like make companies really want to work with you. Um, and that doesn't mean like being fake or censoring yourself, but just having the soft skills to interact well with other people, because there's a lot more of that interaction in entertainment pipelines. And you have to be able to get along with people that you also don't like, because maybe there's a lead that just has a a way he wants things done and you don't agree with that, but they're the lead. So you have to do what they say and you have to be able to work with them and find that middle ground of we're, we're both trying to make the coolest thing that we can here. So let's work together and make it happen. Uh, supremely important for any entertainment job. I can uh, speak to a couple of very specific soft skills um, that I've found to be very useful, uh, especially, <coughs> excuse me, in contrast to the illustration side of things. John uh, English and I have talked a bunch about how in illustration, you know, if you get that assignment that needs to be done the next day, you have no leeway. The cardinal sin in that field is you cannot be late ever, because as soon as you start being late, you stop getting hired. Um, on the concept end, it's a little bit different because you're a designer. And so your expertise is also in telling people what is reasonable and possible. So the cardinal sin of concept art really is uh, ghosting. If you stop communicating, you stop getting hired. Um, and that's actually happening to a couple of like high tier artists that I know where like, I'm not gonna work with them again because they didn't answer my emails for a week. And like, that, it doesn't matter how good their art is. That happens on the illustration side yeah. all the time. And it's the it's a kiss of death um, yeah. for illustrators. Um, that people wonder why, you know, you get a you get a um, a stigma about you that you're not responsible, you're late. And even if your work's great, um, it's too much hassle. I mean, they, they just don't want to deal with it. I mean, uh, at the very least, send an email saying, Hey, I know that this is slipping, but like my attention is on it. I'm here to, to keep working with you. How can we make this a, a successful project even so? Now, obviously, if their deadline was tomorrow and you told them you could have it done by tomorrow and you couldn't do that, that's a death sentence on its own. But uh, if your deadline was two weeks and you're like, because of things that have come up in my life, I have to push for three days, they can say, if you're giving them the information to be able to say, ah, that's acceptable or that's not, we'll, we'll scramble to find a different artist. Um, you are helping fulfill their needs when you tell them, I'm not going to be able to fulfill my commitments as long as you give them the lead time. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's you're subservient to the process. Yes. Um, there's, so there's another soft skill uh, that I'd just like to nod to um, that's kind of specific to concept art, I think, um, and, and uh, in certain spaces for design and ideation, um, where possible, okay, so you need this weird mix of like confidence that your idea is a very good one and humility that lets you drop it immediately if there's a better one that comes along. So there's this, this sort of weird kind of opposing set of forces between you have to represent that you have a lot of expertise while also saying that that expertise will always evolve to the new circumstances. Um, and one of the, the best ways that I've found to do that is to avoid yes or no questions wherever possible, because you don't want to definitively answer things until you, the project is ready for a definitive answer. Instead, you ask, 
why are we doing this? How are we doing this? And what should we be doing next? Excellent. Um, I think that's also helpful, especially in like, you know, review meetings where there's a lot of non-artists who are stakeholders in the process and have things to say. They might pitch out ideas that when they hit your ear, you're just like, oh, that's so dumb. That would never work. We can't do that. <laughs> If you say that, you're going to be in trouble. So you have to develop the ability to like, not like dismiss them passive aggressively, but like try to dig out like, what are, what are they trying to say? What do they want out of this? And like, it's almost like an improv of you have to yes and them until you get what they're actually trying to ask of you. Um, or yes, but. <laughs> yes, oh, but that is too. also <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, and like, have a, an open back and forth. And sometimes they just need to explain to them like, well, here's the, like the, the process of in making this, this is why this thing won't be as successful. We're gonna run into problems here, here and here. And they might be willing to, to change their stance if you're able to have that open collaboration and make them feel like their opinion is just as valuable because it is just as valuable as yours because games are and films, everything entertainment is a collaboration. Um, so you have to have those skills to work with people and sort through different uh, difficult and conflicting problems that you get faced with. Great stuff. Um, so a couple of things I take away from this page. Number one, it's, it's Miro. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we, we, we've just added to our program. Uh, it's becoming which, industry standard. Yeah, and it's, it's again, um the thing I like about one of the things I like about what we're doing, I think we're always up to date. Um, we're, we're, we're chasing what's being done in the industry. Um, the other thing I like is in this title, it's a plan. Um, I have this theory that, and again, I've been teaching industry artists for almost 30 years now. And the goal is, in my mind, if there are people that come to an educational program because they want to learn how to work in the industry. And so the outcome, you know, we don't grade. I always say we don't grade, we don't babysit. <laughs> um, it's up to you to drive it. I think we have a great community where there's plenty of motivation in the classroom, plenty of motivation in our Discord channels. Um, but ultimately, that's on you. But the plan is so important. Um, the uh, getting there quickly, I see the biggest, most common factor of people giving up on their dreams of being artists is life in general. People not thinking through what makes sense, what's the most direct way um, that I can, I can enter the industry grab onto the tail of it and work my way up through the industry. Um, I, I think if I ask industry artists, I, I, I bet if, I, if uh, we were doing a talk with Ian McKaig, um, people that have been working in the industry, illustrators that I know, I've asked this question, when did you start making a living as an artist? They can tell you the month and the year, like, like that, because that's the holy grail. That is the time that their life changed, that they, they could put focus on being an artist full-time and their artwork took care of their other needs. Most people are dealing, uh, most people emerging are dealing it with the other way around. How do I feed this thing until I can get it up and running and get the ball, you know, get it over the hump and get it going downhill, you know, get the momentum. Well, yeah. the way I've said it to people is like, there's a moment where you can take a look at your career and be like, ah, I'm never going to struggle for work again. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, I think that's, it's where number one, it's where everybody would want it. There's a peace of mind about that, but it allows you to be a better artist um, is if you can have the whole day, all of your time focused on making art. Um, it, it, that's when you really get good. Um, the, uh, so my, my message is by watching so many artists try this, 
And this came from this kind of offhand remark that my father would always make when someone would say, Mark, what, what, what's the best way to get started in the industry? He would always tongue in cheek answer the fastest. And, and people think he was joking and, and he was being completely honest. He realized that life is going to get the best of you. You know, um, I put it as, you know, it's, um, it's uh, finance and romance and relationships that, 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 end, that take down more artists than anything else because they didn't take care of that. They didn't, they didn't take care of, they didn't organize their life to succeed. And I really do think an expeditious path to the industry is going to, your likelihood of being in it over time is going to be much more likely if you get there quickly. Um, that's my opinion. I don't know if you have any other thoughts about that, but I think it's very, very important. Yeah. I mean, I think it's an interesting thing to balance because I do agree, like, the sooner you can get yourself stable with art, the more likely you are to, you know, really stick with it and have a, a long and successful career that you can just get all of your needs met purely through making art, which is a great place to be. Um, I also think it's important to be really like analytical and set correct expectations for your timelines. Cause I've had, uh, you know, I've run some discord servers where I help younger artists and I've seen people who are in their twenties or thirties and they're like, you know, I'm, I'm going to go for art. I've, I quit my job and I'm going to focus on art for a year and then be an artist for my career. And I'm like, I love your motivation. You're not <laughs> going to get there in a year. You need, you need some kind of support structure for you to like really let yourself get to the point that you're yeah. ready to enter the industry. Um, Tell you the fastest I see people go from nothing to industry, uh, they can do it in a year. And the only way that that happens is if you live with a top tier artist, right? Like other, if that's not happening, it's going to take you anywhere between two to seven, depending on what your other resources are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so back to what we do is supplying that net, that support mm -hmm. system, that community, to help you get there as fast as you possibly can. And yeah. depending on, you know, a student can take one of our classes, you know, um, I, I'll, I'll skip through here and then we'll talk about some other specific things. Yeah, um, you don't need to take the classes if you live with John Neumeister. <laughs> you can just do that and then you'll get good. <laughs> that's right. And so we're, get, we're giving, you know, uh, well, um, that's, that, was, that was my life, like, my my, I yeah. lived with a great artist. My father was a great artist, a very successful illustrator. And when I was I was going to college, and I came home, and I said, "Well, I think I'm going to give it a shot, Dad." And he goes, "Great, quit school, come home, and I'll teach you how to be an illustrator." <laughs> uh, his point was, finish finish your liberal arts program, and then come home. He said, "So make sure you got something to say," um, and, th and that's exactly what I did. Um, he said, "I could get you there a lot faster." And you have to think about these three things. And I think we embed these three topics in every class that we design. You got to have some level of skill and craft. It's your vocabulary. In certain areas, you need super, super high skill and craft. Other areas, you could be doing it with cut paper. Doesn't matter. Uh, depending on what part of the world or what part of the industry it is. You have to have a way to manufacture solutions and ideas or designs, an ideation process. And then ultimately, and they can they could be a number of different things based on where you you are working. It could be uh, getting from text to to visual. It could be using word stacks. Could cross polarization of ideas. All kinds of things. It could just be thumbnailing and uh, um, you know starting with abstract shapes and starting to carve out uh, pictures out of these abstract shapes. Ideation takes on a lot of different forms, um, and so does process understanding the industry of why you're doing this and what's specific for that part of the industry, I think is the thing that's going to get you there the quickest. Um, we can all get like in our classes uh, that we deliver and the way we organize it, we're all going to be relying on doing certain push-ups and sit-ups. Um, you almost, you're almost, a, you have to think like an athlete at the beginning. The good thing about being an artist 
is you don't have the decline of your physical body. <laughs> uh, on the other end, you keep getting better the rest of your life. You know, my favorite artists did the best art at the end of their life. Um, they they just got better and better and better. I know there's some anomalies that 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 it was different. It was different time periods and stuff. But I think artists will continue if they're serious and they keep working. They just can they just keep learning more and they keep getting better. Um, so an athlete you decline and you got to retire. And so one of the bigger payoffs as an artist is being engaged at the end of your life, being the best you've ever been at the end of your life. That's really backwards from the rest of the world. And I think it's fascinating. I've got to witness it through my father and others. Gary Kelly's going through, you know, his his maturity as an artist when, you know, his body body's decline, declining. He can't physically do what he did, but he's producing better artwork. And that's the, that's the ultimate payoff in a career. Um, think about, you know, I watched all my dad's friends um, who were financial, most of them financial successes. They all stopped doing what they, what got them there. And they played golf and they traveled and weren't that happy. Um, my father was really happy. <laughs> he, every day he went in the studio doing what he wanted to do all the time. And that that's a cool thing. I mean, that's that's an extreme. But I think these three things, you have to address these three things all throughout your career, especially the learning. Mm -hmm. um, these are our classes that we teach in our program. In between, as I said, as we're maturing, there's things that we do. There's push-ups and sit-ups that we do. And it's like, you could go through and take each one of these classes back to back, and it takes a year to do it great information. It's going to give you a structure of how to do it, but you're physically not going to be there. It's like John John was saying, or, or Lake was saying, if you don't live with John Nymeister, um, it, you're, you're probably not going to get there in a year. You got to keep doing additional push-ups and sit-ups. This is how I explain this. And, um, and, I, and I, it makes sense to me. You know, um, there's artists that come into our program, especially on the illustration side, really facilitated. Um, they've been to ateliers. They've been, they've studied and they draw and paint at a very high level. They don't compose very well. They're not good problem solvers. They don't understand pipeline. Uh, the, there's no uh, process of work, the, the, the experience of working with an art director of how you communicate. Um, they don't understand any of that. And then, I love working with those people and putting because you watch it happen so fast. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they get from they go from zero to 100 like that because they have a lot of those built in skills already. So I'm just kind of blabbering about how all this this should work. And I'm going to let, leave it to John and Lake to kind of organize these thoughts a little bit about a streamlined path. And again, that's really one of the reasons we readjusted our program and focus mainly on character design at the beginning, because it is something, as we said, it's a path that's very, that's going to be beneficial to you at the end to be a good character designer. And it's not developing you as a generalist. It's, fo it's focus. So anything you two have to add to this? Yeah. I mean, um, I think that's all spot on. Uh, I feel like character design is to concept art, kind of what figure drawing is to fine art. Like even if you don't want to be primarily a figure painter as a fine artist, there's just so many good exercises that come along with figure drawing of designing shapes and understanding forms and perspective and getting light and matching proportions. Like if you do a lot of figure drawing, it's going to be a lot easier to draw buildings and dogs and flowers and anything else that you might want to draw. It's just such a good consolidated bubble of practice that you can do routinely. Um, I think character design is very much like that for concept art. Uh, not only do a lot of people just want to do character design, but when you design a character, you're confronted with almost every every problem that you might be faced with as a concept artist. So if you can get really amazing at designing characters, then, you know, you could probably transition over to designing weapons, designing creatures, designing environments, because the, the skills are all very similar. Um, 
And I think a great thing about this course too, and how much we focus on uh, just design theory is that it's really appropriate for all skill levels because we're not really talking about technical drawing and painting as much. We're talking about a way of thinking and processes that you can use to be successful. Um, it's kind of like if you learn how to build a house, the technical skills are like the tools that you have. You can build a whole house with a hammer and a bunch of nails. Uh, and so that'll, it'll, you'll make a good house. But if you have chainsaws and, you know, forklifts and cranes, it's going to go a lot faster. And those tools are your technical skills, but the knowledge of how to build the house, you can acquire at any skill level. So uh, yes, John, I, I, I love how you say that because the thing I was going to, yeah, <laughs> it was going to be the, it was going to be the button I tried to push with you. I, I love listening to different classes and going and looking at our documentation in Google Classrooms, which I'll talk a little bit here in about a second. But um, John does a discussion and has a, 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 a slide deck of uh, abstract design theory. And I wish every art student listened to your talk of how to apply abstract design theory to anything that you're doing. You're applying it to character design. And you know what you know what curved lines mean compared to straight lines, or you know directional force, whatever it is. This 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 the, these concepts that you're bringing to it, they're so valuable to an artist in general. And you're taking that and applying it to to the pipeline of character design. Um, could you basically, I mean, very quickly? I don't want to get into a lot of detail of each class, but the objective. Um, you know, we go from your class, John, to Vivian's class, and then Lake picks them up and works with them to help them start developing, you know, portfolio specific industry specific pieces that will, you know, again, a lot of it has to do with skill and craft at where you are. But maybe there's a little bit of an explanation about each class. Yeah. Um... I mean, the intro class, we really have two main goals. One is to just learn design theory, which largely comes down to abstract design theory. Um, a lot of people, when they're getting into concept art, they're really focused on literal content. You know, I want to make a biker girl that has a leather jacket and spiky boots and a machine gun that she uses. Like, that's cool, but there's 10 million of those out there. So how are you going to make this one different than all the others? that comes down to abstract design and how can you just make good looking shapes that are appealing to your viewer uh, and also find unique shapes that other artists aren't using. Uh, so it's a really simple foundation. And then the other part of the intro class is just establishing a reliable process. Uh, so we go through like a very common reusable, I've seen it across multiple different companies process of you know, starting with our thumbnails, going through our iterations, color roughs, turnarounds, finals, um, all of that stuff, all the while focusing on the, the abstract design along the way and being sure we're refining that. So it's really just like theory and process. What are we trying to do and what's the best way to do it? Uh, and that's basically the intro class. Uh, Vivian's not here, but uh, I think the general flow of our classes, they always have that undercurrent of design and process, and they start getting progressively more challenging in uh, the types of tasks that are assigned to you. The first class is very free reign, just learn the theories and try out the process. And then in the advanced class, there's more restrictions and it's more like you're working with an art director and you have to fulfill the needs of the brief. Um, Otherwise, Vivian, it's not going to be a successful piece. Yeah, Vivian um, introduced an assignment last semester that I think is one of the best things to come out of her class where um, students write each other briefs and art direct each other through the process mm. and develop a lot of those soft skills that we were talking about earlier. Um, yeah. the, the shift of the focus of the program into character design has allowed us to make things much more specific in that way. And so you start getting those soft skills and learning how to hit a target given to you by somebody else very early now, um, which I think is, is really, really beneficial. Yeah. 
Um, and then when you enter my class, uh, this you you start looking instead as how do you work as part of a team uh, with with a group? How do you prioritize things? Um, in addition to all of the uh, design theory techniques and kind of basic understandings that are given by John, and then the advanced and uh, more nuanced design techniques given by Vivian, um, I will teach people a bit of when not to use them um, and when to break from the traditions that uh, are kind of like the rules of thumb that are around so that your designs become more unique and memorable because you're in spaces that other people are not. Um, now that you know the rules, I show you when and why to deviate from them. Um, and then another thing that I, I will talk about a lot in my classes is the writing side of concept art. Um, there's an amount of considerations that you have to kind of develop yourself as part of a character design to make a character feel like a real person beyond just, are you fulfilling the kind of um, archetypal nature of them as put forth by the brief? How are you adding to that in addition to what's been given to you? So that's that's what you're doing in my class. Okay. So and then ultimately making portfolio pieces and full model sheets and, and stuff like that. Okay. So it's it has um, it has practical application because you're aimed at okay, the goal is how do we get professional level character design and, and produce professional level work. That is really the goal in either one of our programs, is how can we best help you open the door to the industry and create something that's viable for the industry. So I have, um, is our character design program. Uh, this is not, this is something I do want to talk about. I do want to talk about, these are our six guest speakers for next semester. This slide um, kind of gives you a breakdown. Every week we, in our 10 week uh, program, uh, we have a three hour homeroom class. In each program you have, in those 10 classes, you have three guest speakers attend. They'll come from this world. So uh, um, I'm trying to decide which ones are which. Um, uh, Kayla Valario, uh, Kellen Jett, and uh, Brian Matheny are, or no, uh, uh, excuse me, Brian Mattis, are the three guest speakers for the for the uh, concept side last uh, next semester? Other way around, John. It's Bryn Metheny, Metheny uh, Brian Matias, and Kellen Jett. Okay, all right. I'm sorry. Um, um, I'm flustered. I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, uh, um, I know for sure uh, that the well, I should have done it backwards because I could recognize the illustration ones real easily. Um, the um, we deliver our classes illustration program on Saturday. And then we just started doing this next semester. We're going to live, deliver the concept classes on Sunday. So currently, the illustration students have to watch the concept uh, guest speakers on demand. There's a lot of crossover uh, in what they do and interest. So next, next semester for the first time, since they're on different days, you can watch all the guest speakers live. You'll, see, you'll get six live guest speakers. Your 10 uh, homeroom classes. And then you have a study hall, which I think pulls our, holds our program together. It's my favorite part of what we do. Easy yeah, for me, the, I get, go ahead. Like. The, the program is ostensibly 10 weeks as laid out on the website. But really, if you attend every study hall and then next semester, if you attend every guest speaker, you're gonna bump that all the way up to 23 or 20? 23. 20, no, 23 three hour live sessions with 23 uh, three hour top tier professionals. And yeah. that was, and, and I think that's phenomenal interaction. How we hold that all together um, with our contact is we build Discord channels for every class. You can see the students can see into other classes. They just can't communicate. They can't, um, um, they can see what's going on in the other classes, but your homeroom class you develop a, a, a conversation or an interaction with your instructor on a daily basis or every other day, or however often you need to communicate with your instructor. It gives you a place to stay connected with your instructor and the other students outside of the live class. Discord has been phenomenal for our program. 
Um, and the, the, the energy in those Discord channels is huge. Um, you get to see all the process work done. And then the last thing, you know, we, we deliver our classes like in a Zoom meeting like we're in right now. So you have mic, camera, everything. It's just, just like we're doing right now, except you would be able to communicate with us with your mic and camera. Um, the um, other only other technology we use is Google Classrooms is, and we were just talking about this before, is we distribute information. We give your assignments in there. So you, anything we wanna to hand to you, it's, a, it's organized in the Google Classroom. It's kind of like our ground zero. That's where you get all your links for all the live events. And then of course, everything's recorded and you can watch everything as many times on demand as you want, which makes it great for people outside of the country or different time zones. Uh, many times people will submit work and two or three every study hall, they submit work, they can't be there. And it happens in the live classes too, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the um, homeroom classes. If you've submitted your work in Google Classroom, it's going to get reviewed as if you were there and you can watch it on demand the next day. So it makes it easy to communicate. Um, so I don't someone, know. someone just asked a question, which I hadn't even thought about this. It's pretty cool, John. For an ambitious student interested in both illustration and concept art as potential career paths, would you suggest taking both paths concurrently? You could. You could. You can. Depends how much time you have. If you have yeah, if you have <laughs> the resources, I would say yes, absolutely. Back to living with John Nymeister. That would be, yeah. you would be living <laughs> with a lot of other illustrators. Um, the, seriously, when I talk about gold and goals and expedience, we've had illustration students take um, John's class a number of times. Um, and because they're, they're focused on doing children's book, character design for visual development, and it's just a, it's something they wanted to learn more about. And we've had students take more than one class at a time. Um, I think it takes six or eight hours minimum to get something from our classes um, to, to, you know, through the week. You know, if you have another job, uh, if you have a full-time job, family, whatever, count on, I don't know, six hours on the minimum side. But there's people in our program that use it like their art school and they spend 30 hours plus on the classes. They, that's their whole focus. Uh, so if that's what you want it to be, it can be that way. We're expandable in the fact that we're accessible. You get all these live events plus the Discord channel. I don't think we've ever had a student complain that like, hey, I'm not getting response. Um, our, our instructors are very responsive and we do what we say we're gonna do. Um, we, we commit to, to helping the student through whatever issue that they're you know, working through, whatever assignment. That's really all I have to say about this. The, 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 I th unless John or, or Lake, you got something to add to this. Um, I think that it kind of explains how we deliver. Um, we probably have a lot of questions, Timmy. Uh, yeah. uh, there's one other thing I'll add to this, uh, which is that John mentioned it earlier in this talk, um, because it's becoming industry standard as a collaboration tool, I think next semester, all of the concept art classes will be using Miro to collaborate um, and share work between students. In concept art, it's so important that work contributing towards the same project exist positioned against each other that are fulfilling all of these different needs. And so it becomes really important to see it all at once. Great. Um, one of the things I'll add is uh, somebody, because somebody asked about this, uh, the slide, we are, classes are on Sunday. Uh, that's just a typo on the slide. Uh, ignore that. It's not a, yeah. oh, yeah, it's not a big deal. I copied it over from the illustration <laughs> yeah. and I didn't, <laughs> I changed the top, not the bottom. Um, no, um, but no, we've got a few questions and, you know, if we have a few minutes, I'd recommend a few people, if you've been waiting to ask your your great question, uh, let's hear it. But uh, this one's been sitting here for a while. Um, I have a question. Do you ever use Instagram to show your work? Like what does Instagram represent to you, to you both? Um, I think for me, like there's no harm in having your work in as many places as possible. Um, I wouldn't really bank on an art director finding you there. Uh, I'm sure they 
scroll through and like check out stuff, but they're probably just following their friends and Instagram doesn't have any great like sharing tools. Um, like, I don't think Twitter is a great place to get discovered either, but there's always the chance that an art director or like an artist retweets your work and an art director is following them and they see your work. That's yeah. just not the case with Instagram. So um, there's you no know, harm in posting your work there, but uh -huh. I wouldn't. Well, I'll tell it. you two things. Yeah. Like if I'm trying to hire you and the only way I can contact you is either Instagram or Twitter, I'm not going to hire you. There's, there's no also way true. I have to be able to email you. It's just not going to happen. Like, will you ever click on like a link tree in Instagram or Twitter though? I'll click on a link tree, but if they don't have their email address available, there's no way I'm reaching out. Yeah. For anybody who's wondering what a link tree is, it's a, um, it's a really great, I believe it's, I believe yeah, it's good. The, free, the free version of it's pretty effective, but it allows mm -hmm. you to like kind of, I'm, I'm using it in a couple of other spaces. Yeah. So okay. like if you had a website and you're an art station, you have all these different links like Instagram, Twitter, they only allow you to have one domain. Uh, mm -hmm. listed, and so it allows you to kind of partition that off. Um, I'm sure a lot of our listeners are have already seen it, but um, yeah, here's another. There's, there's yeah, there's probably more uses on the illustration side on Instagram. Yeah, yes, I agree. Uh, uh, Instagram is geared towards illustration and fine art because yep. the the thing that it does above everything else is prove that you have a following. Right. Yeah, I would say that it's just validating more than anything, and it's like a way to, you know to be totally honest, like if you're looking to, do you, I mean, I often use it as a social media platforms uh, outside of art station. I use the social media platforms to figure out, is this person, somebody we want to work with is there are good, but also like, what are they, are they, yeah, I don't know. Are they nice? <laughs> are they, like the, the thing know? that Instagram does <laughs> is if an art director or studio, it, views your work and it's weird and they're like oh man i don't know if this would actually sell uh -huh. then the number of followers you have can mitigate what they perceive as risk oh, that's really but that's it that's all yeah. it's for yeah okay well i i most importantly as a i i'm not dependent on on any social media for sure for for my artwork um school's a different thing um but the um a lot of the artists that I follow have very low, um, they don't pay any attention to their Instagram. You know, I was looking, I was laughing. The only, the only artist I know in our program that, that I have a larger Instagram following is Dale. And uh, Dale, Dale is like the, one of the busiest uh, editorial illustrators in the world right now. And he doesn't really pay much attention to it. And he posts things mm -hmm that aren't really there specifically to get him work. He posts a lot of his personal work, a lot of drawings, things like that. So I'm not relying on it. The people that are, the, the, some of the illustrators I know that are relying on it, they're very careful in what they post. I post a lot of my drawings I do on, from illustration isolation on there. And for the first time, like a week ago, I had a gallery that represents me says, can you please start posting some paintings on Instagram? Uh, because we sell paintings, not these 20 minute drawings you do all the time. <laughs> uh, I thought that was funny, but I, I think that's funny as well. I would say uh, for every, you know, I can count out more, more than five people that I know personally who have like, the 250,000 plus followers who, if you ask them how much money they made off of them, they'll be like, <laughs> uh, um, it's, yeah, it's a slippery slope, but yeah. One other thing that you said that is actually going to, um, to go into one of the other questions, uh, Vicky asked, if you're in a place that doesn't have a large art industry, would ArtStation be the best platform to network? And you mentioned ArtStation in the context of social media. I want to adjust the thinking here because ArtStation is not social media. Mm -hmm. It does have like comment sections and stuff. And technically there are ways you can connect to people, I was gonna but say, it's not, if it's you, not a network. I say that because if you ask an ArtStation ad rep, they call it social media. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> they so I mean, I, I've, yeah. I've, they I've had a conversation with them where, you know, their primary goal yeah. is to put top tier artists in contact with people that are hiring top tier artists. That's it. So the, the way to think about ArtStation is it's a way to get information about the industry from an aggregate source. And it's probably the best 
place currently to host your work. And the reason for that is art directors who are using it can use the like and follow and favorite tools to save artists they want to work with in the future, which is basically how I use it. And a lot of other art directors I know do it that way. But that's it, that's all it's for. I mean, it makes sense. Good to know. Me. It makes sense to me like that it's such a powerful tool for you because when you go to art station, your your activity, your focus is only one thing. Yep. Right? Yep. Yeah. So if you want to network, okay. like it, it's happening on Twitter, it's happening in dis private discords, and it's happening um, at conventions. So yeah, that might mean you have to travel a little bit. Um, and um, on LinkedIn, that's where the industry people are connecting. If you're- if that you're Discord's an incredible resource now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the problem is they're not, it's not a centralized resource. You got to make your way into some private ones, which is one of the reasons that it's so useful to have the Visual Arts Passage Discord because the students can interact with each other in the public forums and stuff. If you're an illustrator and you're thinking about and you're, you're worried about your social media, most people approach it backwards. They think, oh, I'm going to get this big following. I'm going to sell a bunch of my work. I think your following begins from the industry the people that are making the work. And if you're following industry artists, one of the really common practices is, is an illustrator will thank the art director, will post the piece that they just published and they'll thank the art director. If you start following the illustrators that you wanna do what they're doing, you can see all the art directors, they were, they're communicating with each other. Um, and it's a little stockish, but it's, but it's, it, it, you know, it's social media, it's how it works. Um, and so there's a lot to be garnered from that. Timmy, you got another question, I think. Uh, oh, I was just going to say, it's, it sounds like if you're in this room and for this purpose, art station. Art station. LinkedIn. Yeah. You know, LinkedIn, Twitter is a secondary tool. Um, it, it, the thing that art station does that it, it cleanses the, the social part. It makes it very industry worthy. Um, I've had art director, in fact, Mark Chiarella from DC Comics, he said, but he goes, if you... If I go to your Instagram page or your Twitter page, whatever it is, if I'm following you, I don't want to know what you had for breakfast. I don't. I want to see the artwork. If you're going to use that to show me artwork, you better be thinking about showing me the artwork, and it better be the artwork that I want to see. So, um, so you better be th you're really thinking about it. Okay. So um, pulling back to concept or character design, what are some daily habits that we can practice to keep and get our skills sharp? I'd love to hear John tackle that first because you're so focused in that space. Yeah, I think for me, it's a mixture of uh, you have to balance technical and creative exercises. Um, on the technical side, like if you want to be a character designer, you have to be good at figure drawing because you're drawing humanoid things and you have to understand anatomy. So if someone asks you, draw me like some crazy giant guy with shoulders that are like seven heads wide, and has like frog legs, you know how to actually do that and combine those pieces of anatomy together in a way that makes sense. Um, having technical skill is not designing, but it facilitates your ability to design. Designing things is a lot easier if you have strong technical skills. So working on figure drawing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we're called the visual library. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so technical stuff, figure drawing, perspective, composition, shape design, uh, and then creative exercises. That's a little bit more freeform to me. Like obviously you can design characters and just practice designing characters, but I also think it's really helpful to just try and come up with unusual ideas and see if you can execute them visually. Um, one of my, uh, I went to school with Alex Konstad, who's an absolutely amazing artist and concept artist. And uh, looking back on it, I could like see that he was destined for greatness by the way he kept <laughs> his sketchbook. He was always just doodling like, oh, these little like gumdrop people being attacked by zombies in like an isometric camera. And every single day he had some fun new idea that he didn't turn into a full illustration. He didn't like try to make it as technically brilliant as he could. He was just like developing ideas in his sketchbook. And I think that kind of daily creative exercise is a huge part of why he's so successful as a concept artist. 
I, I told my class in the last class of the semester, you know, a good philosophy in my head is just remember ABCD, always be caught doodling. Mm -hmm. And it's very much the same philosophy that uh, Katsuya Terada, one of the original um, Zelda concept artists did. Uh, he calls himself the Rakuga King and Rakugaki is the practice of whenever you have spare time, there's always a sketchbook and a, and a pen in your hand. And it kind of doesn't matter what goes in there and you can draw goofy stuff, you can draw clean stuff. It's just, you're doing it all the time. And um, just like getting into the habit of art is breathing and life around you. Um, and then the side of that, of just like exercises, exercises is I think doing still lifes over and over again uh, I think we just so that's like if, if there's an interesting item that you can encode into your brain by doing a still life of it, it forces you to think about lighting, it forces you to think about composition, uh, it gives you an understanding of material oh, man. information is just so good and dense that the bandwidth can't handle it. That's can't take exactly. it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, too much good I, stuff from Lake. Oh, yeah, it was like, oh, wow. he's just overwhelmed yeah. him. With the, down. Power. Yeah. The, power, the power was too strong. Yeah. Um, here, I think we can, uh, you know, I want to encourage people, if you have any questions, we are going to be wrapping up soon, um, but be sure to submit them. I, I do feel like we kind of tackled uh, Yuki's question, but correct me if I'm wrong, about what kind of character designs or component skills within that are like underrepresented in portfolios, but have a need in the industry. I feel like we, did we tackle that pretty well? Um, we definitely talked about it. I think yeah. one thing I'd add is to just like, look at all the different avenues of concept art because everyone knows about character design and everyone's excited about character design. Some people know about creature design and environment, um, but there's also a lot of stuff that just gets concepted. like. There's artists who just specialize in drawing guns and weapons. And if you are like really interested in the mechanics of guns and weapons, there's a job drawing those and designing those for you. Um, some people just really like to focus in on prop design or user interface icons. Um, there's okay. so many di different pieces of game design that you can get into. So just uh, be sure to explore those and all the options. John, remember Mitch Malloy, his presentation, he, mm -hmm. he talked about how important icons were for him. He said all of the, the number of icons versus the number of characters that are created in a, in a game, he says is extreme on the icon side. Then he said he got really good at doing icons and he's, that's what allowed him, he goes, I made a living from doing that. And he still does them. He says they, he's, they're in, it's all about, you know, they, they had a very specific function that he could do quickly that paid really well. And um, he was smart. Yeah. That's, that's a great entry point into the industry if you want to work in video games. Uh, and a big part of it is just the volume of work, um, which I can personally attest to, like <laughs> on a monthly basis, I think I commission between like 15 and 20 pieces of splash art and probably like 150 pieces of user interface art. So it, if you're able to do user interface art and enjoy that kind of work, there's a lot more of it out there <laughs> that you can uh, get hired for. Okay, so here's another question and I'm gonna kind of, uh, it's a bit longer, so I'm gonna, it's an abridged version of it. Uh, one of my biggest areas of weakness is when it comes to making sure everything is neat and creating those more finalized images that people further down the pipeline would use. When a company is looking to hire, would you say these kinds of finalized character turnarounds and detail sheets are absolutely, absolutely necessary to work on and include in a portfolio? Um, I think we were talking a good bit about this earlier. Um, like we were saying, it's just to like prove your technical skills to an art director. Uh, so it is really important to show um, not only that you can do it, but also that you're aware that it's something need that needs done. Um, a lot of sort of self-taught concept artists, they have portfolios of like final character designs in a cool pose. And it's like, well, that's cool, but you're not showing me turnarounds and you're not showing me like 
the thumbnails and iterations that led up to this final character. So all I know is that you could do one cool drawing. This isn't showing that you can problem solve a complicated thing and explore lots of different solutions until ending up at the best one. So uh, I think it is important to, to show those turnarounds and also to show your like sketches and iterations and the development process of getting to the final. I have one last question that maybe we could end on, but what would you say is like the undercurrent, like undercurrent advice for today that you would give anybody considering this as a career that's come here? I, I'm assuming everyone here is pretty serious about pursuing this. And like one takeaway, because I know both of you have committed a lot of time to navigating to get to where you were and like what resources or attitudes would you would you say you really need to embrace this is one that i i use a lot um we're not here to tell you that you have to pull 15 hour days on doing art to get good and at drawing and painting and design but i did that in school and i know a bunch of other people that did so you got to realize that no matter how you structure your education, you're going to end up competing with people that have worked that much and that hard at it. So exactly what John English said earlier, you have to want it really bad and you have to have a plan, especially if you have limited resources. And I think having a plan for your study is really important and like identifying and specifically targeting the things you want to improve on, because there are a lot of artists who draw a lot on a regular basis and don't really see much improvement because they're just repeating the things they already know rather than being like, I'm good at this, but I'm bad at this. I'm gonna practice this more and get better at it. So if you're trying to get, if your goal in coming to this talk today is to have a career and a job, you have to identify the job you want. You have to look at the artists that are working on it. You have to ask yourself, are you as good as those artists? And if not, why not? Are they better at drawing figures than you? Are they better creative thinkers than you? Do they have better perspective and technical or color theory skills? And those are all things you can put on a list and be like, I need to practice and get better at this thing. Um, and that can be through a class. It can be through you know, books and tutorials, getting a mentor, sharing your work with your friends and peers and being like, hey, can you help me? Like, what can I do to get better at this thing? Um, you have to be very or intentional be all with of your practice. Things. Yeah, yeah, yeah all of those things is best. The 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 quote when I was quoting my father about you know Mark, how do you get there? And he responded, the quickest or the fastest. Um, there's another like interim thing, and it's like, okay, well to get started, you first got to get good, <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, that's you know that that realistic. Um, the reality of, am I ready to start? I mean, and, and, and that's one of the things a community can help you with so much. Um, you know, tackle the person if they're not ready. <laughs> you know, it's like, you got to be, be better at this before you start calling on the art directors you want to work for. Um, because it's, you know, that second, that to go to them the second time is a little bit more difficult. Um, but I, but there's a lot of very, you know, there's a lot of art directors out there that love to talk with people and help nurture people. Um, but there's a lot of them that just won't have anything to do with you if you're not ready to work for them. So um, I think this has been great. Um, one final thing that I kind of left this the other day, uh, yesterday in a talk was the last thing I want to say is about success and failure as an artist. And it's like, the best artists that I know, the most successful artists I know, probably deal with more rejection and more failure than they do success. Learning, failing as an artist is, is a common thing. And learning not to let it affect you too badly, that it's just part of the process. You know, that every, every actor that, that auditions for, you know, the, 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 the best IPs that are coming out, they can't do them all. They could do very few of them and they're going to fail way more than they succeed. Same is true with artists. The best artists out there are going to get rejected. They're going to, well, even in the, in the, in the, 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 the act of making one painting, 
you fail and you succeed multiple times. You know, it, it, you, you think you've destroyed it or you bring it back or whatever. That's kind of the attitude that you kind of have to have. Uh, you're going to have to kind of create a, a thick enough skin that you're you're okay with not succeeding all the time. Yeah. Um, it's like home run averages. Like home run hitters, right. they miss a lot. <laughs> but George, George Pratt, I asked him this question one day. He's the first time that I ever watched him do a um, um, a pen and ink, and I, you know, I've, I've seen other people do pen and ink, and he started this pen and ink, and I was like. George, you, you, you're kind of free flowing here. You're not doing any pencil. And he looked, he kind of barked at me. He looked at me, he goes, I never do pencils. And I, he goes, I never do any underdrawing or anything. And he goes, and I said, well, explain that a little bit. He said, every time I do a pencil, the equation is I never hit a home run. Um, he said, I would rather fail four or five times trying to get there and hit a home run every every fourth or fifth time. I'd rather go through the agony. And his point was the pencil made him tighten up. He wasn't very expressive, and he couldn't he couldn't hit the home run and swing for the fences. Um, there's 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 times to swing for the fences, and there's time to not. <laughs> yeah. um, well, well, I think it, it's very important in concept art too, because <laughs> in terms of like hours spent doing your job, concept art is much more problem solving than it is final execution. So 80% of your work is finding a bunch of the wrong answers, which is technically failure. And yep. then if you get through 20, 30, 40, 50 failures, you'll find the one that works. And then you'll have the design that people remember for years and years. So uh, that's not something that goes away once you become professional. You just have to be comfortable with failing, learning from it, trying again. There's, well, there's just, actually um, something that I say to all of my students, because I think it, it's even more the case than an illustration, because an illustration, the way that you were saying, um, your friend was talking about it, John, like, if he nailed it the first time and was completely happy with it, could kind of push it through. In concept art, I say, if you haven't thrown something out, you haven't done your job. Yeah. Mm hmm you have Timmy, to disconfirm as much as you confirm the reason we're not responding to you timmy you were muted <laughs> i know I was, I was muted that one time uh, i just want to remind everybody that the uh semester starts july 17th that's a sunday um you can enroll right now if you enroll this week this week only we do have the discount code draw more which is 50 dollars off um this is this is the best value like we've ever had for visual arts passage uh, We've always tried to keep our classes under a thousand dollars, but John and I every semester try to figure out a way to make it better. So when it gets better, we still we just we still keep the price the same. Uh, it's not a good business model. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, you know we have more guest speakers than ever. Um, you do because people are at people have been asking about like how do I network? How do I become part of a community? Um, John and I see this, we see these people networking every day. Um, you become part of a community, not just with your mentors, but with your peers in the class. Um, I just think if you're really serious about building a career and when John says like, get there fastest, it's my, my big takeaway from that is don't come up with any excuses to put it off. Um, don't let life get in the way, commit to it. This is a program that within a year you will you will you will start building your portfolio. I, I agree with that. Um, I think I think we ought to let it rest on that. And we uh, the twelfth is our closing for this enrollment for next semester, twelfth of July. And I want to thank John Nymeister and Lake for coming here and educating me. Um, always. I always feel like I'm getting educated from these guys. And um, Timmy, thanks for organizing this. And everybody that joined us, I hope to talk to you sometime. I hope that um, I wish you the best of luck and hope you uh, receive some benefit of what we talked about today. So good luck to you all. Thank you, everybody. It was terrific. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend.